grid and demonstrate uh, quite versatile technologies that we interface in this fashion grid. The plan of the talk and of the workshop in general we mean four phases with the most important one which is about demos. We explain who we are as well as robotics, remind a few principles from Scratch 3 and see how they transfer and apply to our physical robots and then conclude with some final thoughts. So we are a team of eight people uh, coming with ext extensive experience in robotics uh, and we have various partners around the, the area, including research lab like INRIA and the Flowers Laboratory and people from the public sector that help us to start this adventure. And in the past we've been doing a lot of robotic projects. The most important one is we've built a full community of more than 2,000 registered users around 3D printed robotic platforms that makes it really easy for people to start build and use robots. And we have users like artists, education, makers that make use of robots all around the world. We've also been working during our respective PhDs on trying to have uh, human-robot interfaces that are more intuitive for people to make use of robots, to understand how to use robots, how the robots think or behave in a way. And we've also done quite a lot of machine learning where we try to have the robot getting to learn how the human behaves. And along this journey, we've also been applying our work on 3D printed robots to education, thanks to the Forum lab Laboratory at INRIA, where we, we developed those Airflow Junior robots and interface them with the visual programming language, SNAP. And during all those years of experience, we came to, to encounter a lot of frustration in building robots. And that led us to try to solve these problems with our technology that we call Robus. And this technology is really a toolkit that enables you to build robots faster and get to use them and to build your application in only a few minutes and not in months. And th those are a few examples. So, for example, building these robots, like taking this IK lamp and connecting it to the web took us just a few minutes. And then we can build another small cardboard robot with a potential emitter in the arm. And immediately you can connect those two robots and control one with another. You can tune any household and build, add a few sensors on it and it becomes a robot. So, very versatile technology. And at the occasion of the Scratch conference in Bordeaux, we thought, how about combining Robus with Scratch 3? Because Robus gives you the ability to build your robots really, really quickly. And Scratch 3 gives you the ability to program stuff really intuitively and really quickly too. So what about combining those two? And that's what we're gonna demonstrate, but before, I think it's a good idea to step back on Scratch principle and the whole community. And I will do this around two quotes, because I think you already know, most of you already know this. The first quote is about Jean Piaget, that said that children have real understanding only of that which they invent themselves. And each time we try to teach them something too quickly, we keep them from reinventing it themselves. We keep them from reinventing it themselves. That's a very key idea around uh, the Scratch community. And then same paper that uh, instantiated this into education and talked a lot about how we fell in love for the gears of his childhood, but was really uh, aware that the gears were really personal to him and to his personal uh, experience. And he said, why about using the computers that was a really fresh technology at the time to use it to to appeal to the most people as possible. So it's a sense, a sense of the computer, is its universality, its power to simulate, because it can take on a thousand form, it can and serve a thousand function, it can appeal to a thousand taste. And that makes the whole community work around four key concepts that are probably summarized a bit there, but constructivist, which is you want really the children to bring, to reinvent, to reconstruct their own knowledge. So to get to really, to really learn this step from the deep of their mind, you want them to breathe this. For that, the role of the educator is not to give to the children the knowledge, ready-made, ready-processed, but to give the child objects and to develop objects that the child can use to think with the object and construct the knowledge this way. And for the child to use those objects, the object has to come into his world, so he gets, gets to appropriate, to have some appropriation of the 
materials, and because it can bring it into his world, he will use it to do something that he really cares about. And so he will really use it and invest a lot of time and get to create his own concept. And for that, how do we make those objects to sync with? And there is four, three key ideas that Simon Pepper uh, developed, and a nice metaphor is the one of low flow. You want the technology to be really to do something in a minute. So he has no barrier to enter, he's not afraid of starting to use this apparently complex things. But you also want the same technology to have a high ceiling. Because you want with the same technology to be able to do extremely complex stuff, so to not limit the children into a, a tiny compartment where if he falls in love with the tool, he wants to do amazing things. And finally, you want to have wide walls, and that's the idea of appealing to a thousand tastes. You want your technology to be able to go to where the child wants to use it. So that's maybe building a robot, but that can be building a game, building a story, building whatever the, the children wants to use it for. And, and one way that Seymour again brought this idea to life is to move uh, his work from the computer to the real world, to the tangible objects. Because once you get to go into the world where the child lives all his life and all his childhood, you really get to express more taste because computers might be a bit abstract for some people. And, and he did that with bringing the turtle ideas to the physical robots, but also really early on using the Lego logo project where we used the logo programming language to build Lego. And that makes use of everyday intuition. So you see, you see the kids doing many, many things, some building houses, some building vehicles, some building, uh, like an engine, many things. And so in the last 10, last five years mostly, we've seen a lot of robots interface with Scratch. And I categorize them for this talk in three categories. So ready to use robot. The one that you take out of the box and you can already plug them to Scratch and start programming them. And that's really nice because the floor is extremely low. You plug in on the table, you can start to do something. Uh, but it's kind of a black box, you don't really know what works inside. It's hard to, to move outside having a weird robot. Or, so it's hard to appeal to many, many places, but it's really, really easy to start with. Then on the other side, you have Scratch for Arduino, Snap for Arduino, things that allows you to control electronics at a very, very low level, at the GPI level. Mm -hmm. And you can do really low model things, but it gets a bit harder to grow in complexity because if you want to control a complex robot, you would have to all have all these control loops implemented in Scratch and it starts to get difficult. And in the middle, you have something that's really in the, in the line of the Lego logo project, where you have modular construction kits that you can expand and the kids can play with and put sensors and motors and the kid chooses how to put them together. So it's quite expandable and most of the time, and I can tell you all of the time to my knowledge, it's based on a centralized block that you can plug a limited number of sensors in a star architecture. And the technology we developed as a, as a startup to try to help people breed robots we think it really fits well in this category if we bring it to the educational market. And that's Robus. So that's when we're going to start to explain you what Robus is and how it works. So basically Robus is this tiny little board. It's a board that inside can communicate to every other board that's called Robus. And immediately you plug it in, it's detected on a network, it gives you what it can do, what it can't do. Uh, and you have access to immediately to the high level programming language in Scratch or in Python to start to use this board. And if you want one, you use one. If you want ten, you plug the ten together. If you want to use it to two robots, you plug two robots. They come together in the same place and you can start using them. And for the sake of this demonstration, this technology can be embedded into electronics, but we made some blocks that are functional blocks. It allows you to really quickly identify what you're doing with those modules. So this is a potentiometer, position sensor, this is a button, we have some servo motors here. And that's now we're going to show you how this all works together by building different projects in front of you. And that will be uh, done by Pierre, which has been the main lead developer of the interface between our technology uh, and Scratch and Gael, which is an internship in the in the in the in our company that has been developing those usage and how to make this curriculum 
project uh, experiences for for us today. Well, thanks, Dan. So, hi everyone. So, um, as I just said, we're going to show you quite a few demos today, and the very first one I want to show you is actually, as you already saw in this video, we made this very simple carbox robot, just to the way and very simple. Yeah, so what, what things are you to hold on to, you know, because it's a bit hidden. But it's kind of, remember the slide, it's on the ready-made robot side. Inside we have our technology, but we have two potentiometers, so we know the position of the arm, and one servo motor in the head. And so I'm just going to plug it on my computer. And Yes. So here we see we have a ready-made robot plugged to scratch. Ah, yeah, switch. <laughs> Sorry. So you will recognize Quatchway, it's just slightly modified for, for what you want to do. But basically what I can do, I'm just going to connect my new robot, and this brings a new category. And as my robot is actually very simple, I just have two very simple bugs. And I'm just going to, maybe I'm just going to zoom in a bit more so you can all see. Yeah. So the first one, just say position of left arm and then a kind of weird name for robot. It's actually called USB Gate 4. We're not very <laughs> good at naming robots. Um, but so, as the block said, basically it just gives us the position of the left arm. And so, if I click on it, well, with a lot of precision, it tells me that it's minus 3.6, etc. <laughs> degrees. So basically around zero. And then if you can move it. Yeah, so now it's moved to minus 4. So that's basically all you need to do to get info from the robots. And the connection is just directly made like this. And as you can see, it's pretty light. You can just move it directly. So see, it's directly moving. We have the same for the other arm, of course. Yep, so I guess you, you get the idea. And as John told you, you can also move its head. So we have another block for that, which has set head position to also in some position. So I can put it to like 30 degrees, and I just click on the block and it goes to 30 degrees. I can go the other way, of course, minus 45 degrees, go back to zero, etc., etc., and I can start like doing some, some sort of very simple things. How is it connected to your laptop? And on this example, it's using USB, and we will show you with Wi-Fi. And by the way, if you have any questions in the meantime, you can stay too. Okay. Uh, how come the naming of right arm and left arm? Because immediately as you connected it, it yeah. had that. So Actually, each module has its, own, uh, its proper name. So we have... Um, Inside the robot, we have modules like the one uh, I'll show you. And on, the, on this robot, we name them left arm, right arm. Uh, so if you are implementing a specific robot, you can name them with specific names. And if you're building something generic. So if you brought in a new module that you haven't set up before, the yeah. first thing that would happen is you would be able to rename it. Is that? Uh, at the moment, we don't have some easy easy way to do that, but yeah, that, that's exactly the idea. Definitely. And I will show you that just right away. Um, so yeah, and as this is scratch, you can easily combine blocks, use them together, and for instance, I can just say I'm going to put the heads at the position corresponding to the left arm, and I can just put that in a loop, and yeah, you can just uh, some right arm so you can directly have like some sort of immediate feedback and control the new robot like this. So that's the very first demonstration where we, we've seen that with the technology, if you embed it into a robot, straight out of the box, you can use it with Scratch. That's right. Now we're going to see what's actually inside the robot. We're going to break it up into modules and see how we build these robots from some modules. So we're going to do this. So what's inside the robot, as we said before? is a servo motor for the head and two potentiometer for the arms. So I'm going to plug another of this, what we call gate, which is basically an interface between our robot and, uh, and our computer. So I'm still using USB in this case. So here, here we are really just connecting to, the, to this new empty robot. So we have two robots now. One is the power box, the other is the start of a robot. So 
as soon as I connect it to the, this new robot, it brings up a new category and actually this category at the moment you can see there is no block. And that's because well, we, didn't, we didn't, didn't put any modules there. I'm just going to remove this old code that I'm using. And thanks. if I'm just plugging them on, the, on this USB gate, There you go. Now you have a new module. And as you can see it here, it's a pretty generic name. Just really don't feel it. And I can, same as before, start reading the position, start using it directly. And it already knows that this is a potentiometer, so what I'm interested in is it's the angle position. So I can bring a new one. Now I should have two entry there. It's still very generic name and I'm pretty sure you see where I'm going, but you can also add a servo motor and I have a new block for the servo motor. And same as before I can combine them and directly start start interacting with them. So here you really see the module moving with the potential meter. So that's it, you create it. Imagine the kid takes that and plug it onto some car box and you, you, you made a robot in, I don't know, two minutes. Okay. What we've seen, okay, so we've seen that how we actually made this robot. So it looks like a ready-made robot that we engineered, but Deep inside there is this technology that allows you to connect it with scratch. Now we're going to show you how we can combine those two robots and make one influence the other. Yeah, actually, I don't really need to do much because, as you can see, I still have my two categories corresponding to my two robots. And of course, like, as, once again, this is like scratch, so I can mix and match blocks from different categories. So let me just go back to the first example I show you where I control the head of my robots with the left one. This is the left one. And basically what I need to do is remove the, the block that gives me the position from the left arm and instead using the position of the, the, the other potential method and there you go. You have codes that run some different robots combine them together and yeah, that's as simple as it should be. Yes, so that, what have we shown here is really that as simple as you can add modules to create new functionalities in one robot, you can plug two robots and communicate with one another. So you can start making interactive games or many, many applications that the child won't think of because also those robots can be in separate places. So this is USB cables, you can think of them at two sides of the room. We also have Wi-Fi which we show for later on. Uh, so. It's really dynamic when you plug it in, you see it appears, and you can interact with different robots. And actually, we, this is really fresh, the, interac the interaction between uh, the, our technology and the Scratch software is really new. But last week, we were al already able to use this in one of our events in Bordeaux, and we had one, uh, one kid that readily started playing with this. And Gail will explain you what this kid did and how we make up his own story with this news. So as we often underline, it's very important to use the appropriation to to lead children to make their own, uh, their, their own knowledge. So um, this, this child, just a few weeks ago, was discovering the car box robot. And he really began to build his own, his own history with it. So when he saw it, he decided that the robot was like looking angry because sometimes there are some bugs with the motor, so he just turned his head like this. And he decided to make a story in which uh, the robot was looking for its friends. So the first program he made was just the robot was like turning its head left and right for 10 times, then waiting for one second, and finally turned his head left. And then he discovered that it was possible to, to add models on another robot. So he decided to use two distance sensors 
And if at one of the distance sensor at the left of the robot, the other on the right of the robot, and he changed his program, and the aim was that when he was at, at the end of the program, at the left of the robot, the robot was turning its head at the left, and when he was at the right, the robot was turning its head at the right. So it was a very simple story, but he really enjoyed it. And he, he, was just going on, and then he decided to add a LED and was like, oh yes, I can add a feedback, so when my robot is angry and is looking for its friends, the LED is going to be red, and he's just going to turn his head, and when he's happy at the end of my little story, uh, the LED is going to have a green light, so um, it's going to show to everybody that uh, my robot is happy because he finally he made it to find his friends. So Pierre is actually rewriting the, the little program that this child made a few weeks ago. So actually I've uh, just and it was pretty cool, we just saved this project and I'm just rewriting it at the moment. And uh, just to, as Gael show you, so the, it, maybe I can run it by step by step so you understand. So the first step we did was just, you know, using like the kind of blocks I show you, and then start to slap the robot and look around and and as you can see, he's already using the left to say that it's red, so he's not happy at the beginning. And then he had this new code, and actually he uses some sort of distance sensors, so that just basically gave me the distance where my hand is from it or any other pattern. And he used that to help Carbox find his friend. So if I run it again, maybe yeah, you can... And maybe you will screw because I'm whatever. I don't remember which one is which, so maybe it's we will look at the other side. You get the idea. So basically he's looking for his friend and he's detecting on one of the sensor if there is someone, look in this direction and then turn green again. And that's that's pretty cool to see that the the kid was actually not trying to build the robot, he was trying to build a story and the ro robot in the program were just some supports to that and it was really like you said at the beginning, re the, the appropriation of, of technology to, to reinvent uh, the, the learning. So maybe you can just explain roughly what's on the screen there because it looks like already a complex program. So people want to. Yeah, yeah. So the Actually, the, the beginning, so maybe I will split directly. So first, this just turn the red red. <coughs> then you have this loop, and just make it look back and forth, right to left. Just gonna stop it. Then it looks back at the end the center, and then it just tests if the distance on one of the sensor is like not too big, so it means that there is an obstacle near. So in this case, it looks left, and if it's not on the left side, it's probably on the right side, so you look on the right and then turn green again. And actually I want to emphasize this that the code was really made by this kid and like, I don't know, a quarter or something like this. So, that was at an event we called Aperobo in Bordeaux where we bring every robot passionate to there and that was a kid. And that's his very first program with the car force robots. And you see that it's kind of very happy to show us that it's made a connection with the right arm to the end. So really simply, you see on the screen it's like two lines of scratch. So quite interesting. So you see already we've been using potentiometers, thermometers, piston sensors, and LEDs. All that combined, it's one robot controlled with like a controller that the child was able to build. And that was totally unexpected from us. Like we, we went there to test this to see if it would work in a real condition. And then the kid just came in and kind of smashed us as using Scratch. It was a bit better than that. <laughs> and he just built that and, and made up his own story. So that's good that to see that it was actually having the effect he wanted. Uh, I think it's time for a few questions at this point. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we can, and, uh, we can keep going with some more demo.
Okay, you take that for it. Where can you get it? Oh, sorry. Where can you get it? Sorry? Where can you buy it from? So we will talk about this. For now, this is uh, our prototypes that are really functional, and we are looking to like, work with educators to bring that into kids and experiments with kids. So you can buy it to us right now <laughs> in, the, in this format. Um, so now we're going to see something that well, that you've seen many times probably, but just to, to check that this technology is actually able to interact with Scratch itself. Because most of the time kids also want to play with what's in the Scratch system, which is sprites and video games and accessing the web, this kind of thing. That, and, and for that, we're going to build ourselves, uh, no, we're going to connect this box with Scratch. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to show how we can use the robot as an input for Scratch. So, for example, if we want to make a, in a simple game this, uh, this little total moves, we can use the left and the right position of the arm and <coughs> control the X position and the Y position of the total. <coughs> So you also see here, I don't know if you saw that, it's dynamically adding one dot for what each robot. So we have two robots connected, and we can see that straight in the interface. So you want it to have like, sorry? Uh, for example, the, the, left, the left arm yep. controlling the exposition on yep. the room. I can make my little dot move as if I just had a kind of remote control. Um, why not adding the position of the right arm to control the X position, the Y position? Okay, so now I, I can make my, my little dot over moves everywhere on my screen. So that's very basic, but it's just to, to give you the idea. Okay, so uh, why not try to, to make a, a little game like imagining that a child is just, um, he has the modules and he want to make his own, his own remote control for a little game. So for example, he is going to take a potentiometers or he can direct the orientation of the turtle. Okay, so now we can direct the orientation of the turtle. And I don't know if he wants to, to shoot turtles with, with a push button, so I have one here. So thanks to the push button we can create clumps of the turtle and we're going to shoot. Yes, you want to shoot turtles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with how kids are doing animation on Scratch. Actually, I've, I must confess that I didn't know and I had to go on their project and see how they're doing it and that's actually pretty clever. So basically, you're cloning yourself and when you're cloning, you just have to move. Whenever the direction was, maybe not that fast, this fast, and you move until you reach the edge of the, um, of the screen, and when you do that, you just delete yourself. Okay, let's try it. Let's try it. Yeah, good. <laughs> now I can shoot. So what's, what's happening here? Can you explain me this? So you, I can make it even better. This one's <coughs> I want to show a small one. Can you try it again? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the idea is whenever you have this add block that is called whenever you press the button, so whenever you press the button, turning your phone sprites, and your phone starts to move until you reach the edge and understand that's the deal. And yeah, will be enough for a your this is perfectly. But, yeah. It takes 10 minutes to understand this and use it. Everywhere. 
So it was just, um, yeah. How many devices can you control? How many servers or? Uh, in theory, an infinite number of well, It will be limited by physics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can plug, we, we did robots with 20 modules in a row. So you can do this. You can, and also, in theory, you can have an infinite number of different modules and robots like branched and we'll be you later also Wi-Fi connected so it's quite like pretty open as a as, as, uh, abilities you can do with this uh, we, we're gonna move now to a very interesting thing uh, do you have a question on this because this is quite a complex program for so little code and, and an interface you can really have the kid really his own interface to play a video game for example it is into video games you can have an interface to control another robot. You can have also, we, we didn't demonstrate that yet, but you can have the keyboards to control a robot. So you can do it really both ways as transparent. Um, okay, so that's what we've shown. We can build your own robot and control a scratch. And now is the great stuff. Now is getting ready for using your imagination and you're a kid and you're at home and you want to help your mother. Your mother is vacuuming all day and you really want to help her. So you take the vacuum and vacuum cleaner and you take two motor modules, you plug them in the back, you glue them however you can. Kids can use, we use glue gun but because it's fun for us. But you can use car box, you can use some tape, you can use anything you want. You plug it on the robot and in a few minutes, this is a Wi-Fi um, Connection, so you have, it, you have a Wi-Fi so you can control it remotely because that needs to be autonomous. And you have a battery and you plug the Wi-Fi modules on the battery. <coughs> now, and it's always the stressful time when you're doing live demo is... Okay, we do it. So, just a bit here, like you can select from this robot that has a real name, we feel gay. It's like a Wi Fi connection. And if we connect to it. Yep. So, if you connect to it, well, you see pretty much the same stuff that you've seen before. And this time, as this is, well, the robot has already started, we have some more of the name. And actually, we have one block to control the left wheel and one block to control the right wheel. And as this wheel, I just can send them speed. So maybe if you can pull it, so you just, you just crash anything. And you just set the right speed to 20, and it starts moving. I can stop it, I can make it go the other way. So of course, as I'm robot, this is the first thing I want to do is to build myself some soft interface to <coughs> drive my robot several. So once again, all kids doing Scratch know how to use those um, key functions that when you press a key, it's just called this, this kind of blocks. And first thing first, I want to try to make it go forward when I press the up forward. So I'm just going to set the speed on both my motor to 20. Maybe John, you can put it. Um, I don't know if Let's do it here for yeah. now. And so we'll it to make sure, yeah. You can see that. Yeah. So, it's also on the screen. I'm pressing up. Oh. oh. That's not exactly going forward. <laughs> so, here, here is. That, that's puzzling, you know? Yeah. Does anyone know what did happen? Because it's it's not not the yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. And actually, that's the very typical mistake that like, everyone made, actually, myself included, the first time that you plug the robot. And we think that's really a very good example of where you actually play with a physical object, you try, you make some errors, you like you have to look and just quickly realize that, yeah, that was very simple. And then you really understood what the problem was and yeah, you, you will remember. So let's just go make one of them go the opposite direction and there you go so now i'm just going to duplicate this oh, sorry. <laughs> maybe i will safety first when i press 
Whenever I would press space, I would even stop my words. Yeah. Now I can mix people in. So I'm just gonna go. When I press down, I go the other direction. This is how it goes. Doing that. And let's do the left one. I never remember which one. I should have done the right one. Right. And see, here again, it's really easy to just, I don't remember which side it switched. You just try and see what happens. And you have like this really immediate feedback, which is so important. Here we go, now I'm all set. So I'm going to put it on the floor. And then you're going to see it on the fourth screen here. Uh, so now in what? Let's go eat five minutes, but that's more than what? We have a remote control vacuum cleaner that you can already help your mom with by vacuuming the floor. And that I think is quite impressive that we can use this on everyday objects. I cannot really go into the corner, but that's just because I'm not by the way. So let's go a bit more crazy than this, isn't it? So what we've seen before is that this is one robot that we plug in a few modules. We have the Wi-Fi, we can connect it, control it remotely with the keyboard. And now what about breeding our own controller for this robot? So we're going to breed a second robot that's going to help us control the first robot. So first I'm just going to plug one, another of this Wi-Fi Wi-Fi module that I've just uh, connected to like the very typical um, phone battery, and I should have my new gate now. We are straight on the screen. Yeah. Really a problem. Um, so that's my new category, and as you can see, there is no blood inside. I have no module there. So let's see how I can I build my self controller. Well, as I said before, safety first. I'm just going to give myself a stop button, an emergency button. So whenever I press this button, well, I'm just going to stop all that. So I'm just going to try that. So we'll stop here, I think we'll break something, but we have seen that robot walk downstairs, so it's the same thing, two sensors, two wheels. I'm going to conclude this to answer a bit more of those questions if I find them out. Here. So, a few final thoughts, and then you can come and play with, with uh, technology. So what we've been showing is that, by default, this technology, if you build a robot with it, a nice little robot, like the one that's going around the room, you can already interconnect it with Scratch, and with all the capabilities of Scratch, that is, keyboard control, interacting to make video games, the new capabilities of Scratch 3, but this is Scratch 3 compatible already, so you can voice recording and detect a, play a sound that plays when someone enters your room because there is a sensor that detects them. We also saw that the same technology has the ability to have the kids breed their own robots using modules. That makes exit more into the, the higher walls or the wider, uh, the higher ceiling and the wider walls so you can adapt it to whatever field or activity you want. But most importantly, what we've shown is that its capabilities are really infinite that they can, you can have in your classroom or at home, you can have 10 robots and you will be able to control them with the same graphical interface to do really complex and amazing things that could interact with them in your home. So that's really pushing, we think, because of stretch rate, the floor lower, the ceiling higher, and the wall wider. 
And the final interesting parallel is between just the way Scratch is conceived and the way Robust is conceived. In Scratch, you assemble blocks to create new interactions. In Robust, you assemble modules to create new interactions. So you have kind of this parallel, this symmetry between the visual aspect of Scratch where you have blocks combining and the visual aspect of those, this kit that is functional blocks interacting together. You can create several sprites to expand interaction making games. In Robust, you can create several robots that can interact together again making games. In Scratch, you can have sprites that have properties like colors, size and functionalities and they can move in the space and in Robust you have modules that have their own properties like their color or reality, their position for a sensor, their functionality like a motor. And finally in Scratch, the interface is the interface is reacting with the add or delete sprite so you really know what is available to you and that's the same thing with Robux when you plug or unplug modules that they appear and they disappear and you can change their name. You can really make uh, make a full experience out of it. And so as I said before, our core competencies is the technology behind this, it's the architecture that allows all this kind of like magic stuff to happen, but that seems so natural to every kid. It's just, I have a button, I want to plug it in and I want to press it and get the event out of it. And that's it, that's all you want, but what's happening behind the scene is extremely complex and that's what we do. So here for the Scratch 3 conference, for the Scratch conference and the event of Scratch 3, we are available and we want to work with people in education to develop new projects with them. And finally, we also have uh, like a guiding principle in our, in our, in our uh, startup at Poland Robotics is that all these tools that facilitate the creation of robots are made to go beyond education. And the same tools, which is robust modules that you plug together to build robots, an easy graphical interface to control them like Scratch, can make robots accessible to everyone, to more and more people that will be able to just simply like imagine a worker on a chain that has a robot to work with him or, or uh, in a small uh, company that wants to build a robot but can not afford a coder. You can just code it with Scratch very easily and you can get, and we've seen some demo from generation robots that are doing a Sawyer control with Scratch. Not the same idea. You want to bring the, the barrier to entry low to everyone. And so I'm inviting you to come and have a play with this and imagine what will you make with Robust and Scratch 3.0. Thank you very much.